Today we're kicking off a brand new teaching series entitled Stories of Faith, Stories of Faith. But for just a moment, I want to encourage you, if you guys uh, receive one of those printed connect cards on your way in, to begin filling it out now. The end of today's worship gathering, you could place that on the offering plate as it goes by. If you didn't receive one, that's okay. If your preference is to fill it out digitally, you can do that by scanning the seat back in front of you. At the bottom of both of those cards, though, I do want to just take a moment and highlight that there is a prayer request section. We are a praying church, and we believe in the power of prayer, and I'd encourage you to fill that out, whether it's a prayer request or if you just want to praise God about something, we want to come alongside you and do that. Also on the seat back, you'll see a button labeled message notes. You can click on that and follow along on the YouVersion Bible app. But we will be in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, like I said, we are kicking off a brand new teaching series entitled Stories of Faith. Stories of Faith. Just a little bit of background about what's going to happen in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Last week, we wrapped up a teaching series entitled Best Sermon Ever, where we took nine weeks to study the book of Matthew chapters 5 through 7, where Jesus taught the most famous, famous sermon ever called the Sermon on the Mount. And so Matthew chapter 8 picks up very quickly after the conclusion of Matthew chapter 7. He is coming down the mountain from teaching his disciples and all of the people that surrounded them. And so he's coming down the mountain as we pick up in Matthew chapter 8, starting with verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 3 says, reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, be clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Then he told Jesus, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Again, we see in verse 8 the word he came down from the mountain. He is referring to Jesus. Jesus just concluded the Sermon on the Mount, and he encounters a man with leprosy just out to the city limits of Capernaum. The city of Capernaum. He encounters a man with leprosy. This man comes and approaches Jesus, which is a whole big thing, and he has leprosy, and he asks him, Lord, if it is your will, make me clean. And so Jesus reaches out, and he touches this man, and he cleanses him of leprosy. What is leprosy? A lot of times in the Bible, we've heard of the term leprosy, a little bit in the Old Testament, a lot in the New Testament, specifically in the gospel accounts, we hear about this word leprosy. And a lot of people, when they hear this word leprosy, if you have uh, been in church for a while, or you've been in the medical field for a little bit, leprosy is essentially a disease where the nerve endings in your skin, they just die. And so you can't feel physical pain anymore. And so a lot of times with leprosy, these lepers, they have cuts or bruises or scrapes or abrasions on their skin. And it has no feeling to them, but it's, it's, it's gruesome. And so these lepers are forced to live outside of the city limits because leprosy is an airborne disease. So if you come in contact with a leper you have a strong likelihood that you will, in fact, contract leprosy. Now, in the biblical times, it's important that what Jesus is referring to is that version of leprosy. But it's also important to note that back in the day, go figure, they did not have modern medicine, so they just lumped everything in with this term leprosy, meaning if you had a bad rash or a bad sunburn, it began to blister and boil. If anybody has ever gotten one of those, we're in summer in Florida, Okay, you guys are much better and more diligent about sunscreen. I remember when I was in high school, I got such bad sunburn on my back. I looked like I was going to turn into an anamorph. If you know what that is, you know how old I am. I was turning into a reptile. And so in those days, that would be considered, I would be deemed potentially a leopard. And so I had to go to the priest and I had to have him examine me. And in Leviticus 13, Moses uh, outlines what to do in this circumstance, how to actually determine whether or not somebody has leprosy. It was up to the priest to determine this. 
not a medical physician or anything of the sort in those days. And so the priest would examine you and he'd say, okay, you're going to go into quarantine for seven days. This sounds oddly familiar. You're going to go in quarantine for seven days and you're going to return to me. And if your condition has worsened, you will have to go live on the outside of town so no one else has the potential of contracting your disease. But if you maintain your status or if you get a little bit better, we're going to put you in quarantine again for seven days. And on the 14th day, I want you to come visit me and we will determine whether or not you have leprosy. And in Leviticus 13, it goes into more detail about what, what that looks like. Um, whether it was hair color or sores or anything like that, it goes into more detail on how these priests were to determine if someone had leprosy. And I can promise you, it was not rocket science. It was not something they would do, they would like take like a sample and, and all these kinds of things. No, it was, it was pretty rudimentary. And so there was many cases where people were deemed to have leprosy. They'd go live in these camps and they would actually contract leprosy as a result. Nonetheless, these lepers lived on the outside of camp so that this could not spread. And in fact, if a leper was deemed unclean and they were sent into the outskirts of the city where Jesus encountered this man, they would have to shout as loud as they could if they saw somebody in the distance saying, unclean, unclean, because they did not want another person to approach them because they were worried they would further spread the disease. And so Jesus encounters this man on his way back into the city, shouting, unclean, unclean. And this man approaches Jesus, recognizes who he is, and asks him, Lord, if it is your will, if it is your will, may you make me clean. And Jesus reaches out and touches this man. This is probably the first physical embrace this man has encountered since, he's, since he was placed in quarantine for the first time for leprosy. And Jesus says, I am willing, be clean. He tells the man, go, go see the priest so they can confirm this. Don't tell anybody else. Go see the priest and do what the law of Moses instructs you to do. Go and do what the law of Moses instructs you to do. It's interesting to me because the man doesn't come up to God and say, heal me. He doesn't come up to God and try to touch his garment like we've read in a different miracle that we'll get to so that he can be healed. He comes up to God and says, if you are willing, make me clean. He knew who Jesus was. He understood the authority and the role that Jesus played in this life. And he asked him, Lord, if it is your will, make me clean. Make me clean. Jesus heals him, and he enters the city of Capernaum. And soon after arriving, we see what happens in verse 5. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you under, come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he does. And I say to the other, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Verse 10 says, in hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, truly I will tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from east to west and to share in the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But if the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then Jesus told the centurion, go as you believe, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. The Roman centurion. Jesus just encountered a hopeless man who had no sense of authority in society. In fact, he was outcasted from society. That's how little authority they had when they were deemed a leper. They weren't allowed to come in. They weren't allowed to worship in the temple. They had a small room, a leopard room, where they have little slits that they could hear the message that the priest was giving. And so they could worship God. But they were social outcasts. And he encounters this centurion, a man of authority. A centurion means a man who is in charge of 100 men. That's where the word century comes from, 100 men. And in the Roman Empire, you have the authority of the emperor. 
a centurion, a higher rank in the, in the Roman emperor's army. If the emperor was absent, he had the same level of authority as the emperor. Meaning, if the centurion uh, asked his men to do something, they were to carry it out as if the emperor asked them to. Not the centurion. He was a man of authority. We have a hopeless man at the city gate, and we have a man with hope, both of which are asking for God, God's will to be done. Both asking for God to heal the first himself and the second somebody else. And so the centurion asks God, can you please heal my servant? He's living in utter agony. He's asking for his will to be done. And Jesus says, okay, I will come and heal him. And he said, no, don't come to my house. I understand who you are, what authority you have. All you simply have to do is say he is healed and he will be healed. And it says that Jesus was amazed. In the original language, this word amazed was used to describe the disciples when hearing Jesus teach. In awe of what God will do and has done. And Jesus is having the same response when hearing the centurion express his faith in God. And Jesus is in amazement of the centurion's faith and says, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. And then he heals the man just from where he stands. Both of these men. We see two men. A helpless man with no hope and a helped man with hope. Both of them asking God for his will to be done. Both of them with faith. My question to you is, are you living by faith? Are you living by faith? Does the encounter with these two men individually, these encounters with Jesus, give these men faith? Is it the fact that Jesus came along and healed the leper and came along and healed the centurion's servant give them faith? No. They're demonstrations of the faithfulness that they had in God and the authority that they had in his life. They did not approach Jesus and make a demand. Lord, heal me. Lord, heal my servant. They asked him for his will to be done. Can the same be said for you and I? How often do in our lives we approach God, we pray to him, we plead with him, we beg for him to do something. We beg for him to move something forward, to ask him, where should I go? What should I do? How should I do this or that? Lord, please let me get this far. Please let me prosper. Please let me do all of these things. And we try to superimpose our will on God as if we have the authority to make the demand. We ask God, please extend my will, me as an individual, above yours. Lord, heal me. Do this for me. As if we have the authority to make the demand of God. Am I the only one who does that? Who comes before God and says, God, you are going to do this for me. Because for no other reason, I'm a good Christian or I'm a good person or I do so many good things. I work hard. I make sure that I tithe. I make sure that I serve the church. I read your word. I try to grow in Christ's license. So you're going to do this for me. We have no authority to make the demand. These people approach God understanding they have no sense of authority to make the demand. And they simply ask God, your will be done. Do you think the leper wants the Lord's will to be for him to be cleansed from the disease? Do you think the centurion wants for the Lord's will to be to heal his servant? Of course. But they approach God and say, you have the authority. It is your will to be done. It is your will to be done. Oftentimes in our life, when we come before God and ask Insert the prayer request here that you've been praying for for years. We ask, we plead, we beg. God, do it. And when God doesn't do it, we count it as trauma. We look at God and 
think, why doesn't our will align with his? As if our supersedes his. I know what's best for me. Why doesn't God know? When God performs his will, because he ultimately always does, we view God as the one who is wrong. God's response to our prayers, our petitions, our pleas, are very well maybe the reason why all of us are sitting here today or not sitting here today. Perhaps some of you have a friend or family member who refuses to come to church because they don't believe that God answers their prayers in the way they think they should be answered. They know who God is. They know Jesus. They understand there's a supreme ultimate power who has the authority to make things happen. And we allow those answers, those responses by God to paint the picture of our life, our experiences, our perspective. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Psalm 25, 12. What are you haunted by? You will say by nothing, but we are all haunted by something. Generally, ourselves, and if we are Christians, it's by our experiences. What are you haunted by? The things that keep you up at night. The reason behind the anxiety, the depression, the stress, the unwillingness to do certain acts. Some would say, in fact, I would argue that in most cases, it's by the way God responded to your request. I'm not here to judge. I'm I'm the first one to tell you that this is my life. This is my experience. I ask God and plead with God, God, please do a miraculous work. And oftentimes in a lot of your lives, when you fill out those prayer requests, they don't just go into the, into the garbage pail. They don't just simply get prayed for once. Lord, let your will be done. And sometimes it's frustrating when his will does not align with our desires, with our hope, misplaced hope. So are we living by faith? Are we asking the Lord, let your will be done? Are we approaching Jesus and asking him, Lord, you are the ultimate authority. You are sovereign and in control. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. I know for me personally, this is something difficult. And it's not something you learn and then you live with. It's something you have to learn and put into practice over and over and over again. I remember when I was returning from a trip from South Africa, while I was on the trip, I felt this urge to quit my job. I was in college at the time and just go full-time into Christian ministry. I was making like $50 a month. It was the best decision I've ever made from a purely financial standpoint. No, I'm I'm just kidding. But I felt this urge, and when I went back to work, it wasn't as simple as, oh, God put it on my heart to quit my job. No, there was wakeless night, or there was sleepless nights, there was difficulties battling the situation, not able to comprehend what God is truly doing because He only gave me the nudge, He didn't give me the blueprint. And so often in our lives, that's the case. We feel a nudge for to do something on behalf of God, to live in accordance of his will. And we expect a full-blown map with a GPS that speaks 27 different languages and will re-guide you if you get off the path. They'll also pay your way and everything else. That was me and continues to be me. But I came back from this trip and I go into work on Tuesday because I worked Tuesdays and Thursdays because I was in school Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I go into work Tuesday. The boss that I had to speak to about this was sick. I'm like, this is the sign from the Lord. I'm not supposed to do it. <laughs> he answered all of those pre- pleas and prayers that followed the nudge from God. And then Thursday rolled around, and I'm like, I'm going to let the day get started. And then I will talk to him. And lo and behold, 15 minutes after we started the day, he comes into my office, and he sits down, and he says, well... We're going to have to let you go. I said, 
that's awesome. I came in to quit. And so he kind of laughed. We had a pretty good relationship. And then he got up and asked what I was going to do. And I said, I felt this nudge from God to just go into full-time ministry. I was serving with the church at the time, but I wasn't dedicating all of my time to it. And he said, that's awesome. And then he put on like a stone face because he just fired somebody. He's not supposed to be laughing. He walked out of my office. But that journey from that day to today was not easy. I've questioned God many, many times. It's a natural thing to do. So don't think that I'm standing up here in a position of perfection. I'm telling you from personal experience, I have asked God, what are you doing? It's not because I lack faith or I don't understand that he's the God of this word, that he is the God who sent his son to die for all of our sins because he understands that his will is going to be done regardless of my response, just like yours. I could pray and plead and try to superimpose my will on God and call it faith, but his will is ultimately going to be done. These acts of faithfulness, living by faith of the leper and the centurion and understanding that God is sitting in an authoritative position, that he supersedes everything we can ever fathom and everything we could ever control. When I lay awake at night, it's simply because I have anxiety and stress about something that's well beyond my control anyway. So church, I ask you again, are you living by faith or are you lacking it? Are you living by faith or you're lacking it? This is not a question that has a degree. It's a yes or no. There's no maybe. Sometimes. Are you living by faith or are you lacking it? Are you approaching God and saying, let your will be done? Or are you pleading with him, asking for your will to be done? Imposing what you believe he should do next. What does it truly mean to live in faith, to abide in Christ, to pray, to read his word, to seek his face, to grow in Christ likeness? What does that look like practically? It's funny because Andy came today and he sang for us, and this was not planned, but about like 10 years ago, we were in South Africa together on a different trip. The first time I went to South Africa, I was 18 years old. It was life-changing experience, and Andy did what he does best, and he played his, his music. He worshiped God. Pastor Tim gave a message and offered the ability for people to respond. Just much like the worship gatherings we do here, we had people at the front of the stage, and I just happened to be one of them that day. And when Pastor Tim gave that response, a man came up to me, and Andy soon followed because he wanted to pray with him also. And the man told us this. He was about 30 years old, and he said, I've known Jesus my entire life. I know everything about Jesus. I know Jesus. I know who he is. I understand what he did, the miracles he's performed. I've attended church for a long time. I know who Jesus is. But today, for the very first time, I met him. Much like the leper living on the outside of Capernaum. He knew who Jesus was. He understood what he could do. But on that day, he met him. He stopped relying on his own self-reliance. Stopped trying to impose his will upon God and praying to God, asking and making demands. Instead, he acknowledged the fact that he's known God for a really long time, much like some of us here, and he decided to take himself out of it and meet God that day and said, Lord, let your will be done first, starting with my life, every facet of it. So many of us here can claim we know God. We've heard of God. Perhaps your parents went to church or your grandparents went to church. Or some of us have a praying grandmother or great-grandmother who looked and longed for us to be here today. Or you have a friend or family member or neighbor who's prayed and asked for you to be here today. I know we've prayed for you to be here today for the reason that I could tell you and plainly tell you that you need to ask God's will to be done and ask you a very simple question. Are you living by faith or lacking it?
Are you living by faith or are you locking it? We claim we are living in faith, but then we beg and plead with God to give us a sign. We pray and make demands of things of God in faith. And we pray and plead with God to make our will, my will, your will to be done. We ask God to conform to our will. But church, what authority do we have to make that demand? What authority do we have to make the demand of God? What authority do we have in, 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 in this cosmic like ethos, this, this great God that we have that controls the entire universe? What authority do we have to make a demand of God? We have none. Yet we do it continuously. We forget the origin of our story. We forget the why we need a savior. We forget the how it was done. And we approach God time and time again, begging and pleading for his will, sorry, our will to be done instead of his will. We have short-term memory. We forget that it is his will. When these two men, a man full of hope, doing fairly well, leading a hundred other men, approach God in faith and ask for his will to be done for healing. And then the man who's hopeless, living on the outskirts of town, asked him, Lord, if you are willing, cleanse me. These acts of faithfulness started and ended with God's will being done. These two men were just asking, inviting him to do it. A lot of us ask, where do I go? What do I do? We beg and plead with God for direction, a sign, something. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, have you ever been out in this way? If so, there's no logical statement possible when anyone asks you what you are doing. One of the difficulties in Christian work is this question, and I think it holds true for all of our life, every single one of us. What do you expect to do? You do not know what you are going to do. The only thing you know is that God knows what he is doing. Continually revise your attitude towards God and see if it is going out of everything. Trusting in God entirely. It is the attitude that keeps us in perpetual wonder. You do not know what God is going to do next. Each morning you wake it is to be a going out, building in confidence on God. Take no thought of your life, nor yet for your body. Take no thought for the things for which you did not take thought before you went out. How many of us, how many of us are asking God, what is he going to do? The answer is he'll never tell us. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his crucifixion and is begging and pleading with God to take this burden and place it upon somebody else. He understood that it was the Father's will. He understood what he was asking. He was sweating blood, pleading with God. And you know how God responded when he asked for somebody else to take this burden? Silence. But was his will done? Did Jesus go to the cross to die for all of us for the sake of all of our sins, our trespasses? Of course, because it's his will. Jesus opened the conversation with God and said, let your will be done. But please take this burden and place it upon somebody else. Take this cup from me. But the Lord's will was done anyway because the Lord is sovereign and in control and he understands what's going to happen tomorrow and 10 years from now and in the next generation. He understands why your grandmother and grandfather, who, were th who they were. He understands why your parents were who they were. They understand why we are who we are and what we are going to do and he understands where our kids are gonna go and what they're going to do and what they're, like my grandkids are going to do. He understands all of these things and he has a holistic picture of everything that he is going to divinely appointedly do because his will is going to be done. It doesn't matter. His will transcends generations. The question of whether or not remains. Are we living by faith? 
Do we believe he's going to take care of our kids, our grandkids? Do we believe that he's going to be sovereign in control thousands of years from now? Yeah, because he's already done it and he's going to continue to do it. The question still remains, are we going to live by faith? What proof do you need? You're sitting in God's presence, yet we remain unsatisfied. For the simple fact that we are imposing our will upon God rather than living by faith. Lacking faith is far more comfortable. Trying to find the edges of something is far more comfortable than living by faith. These are my experiences and I can attest to them. I could also tell you that both of these men understood who Jesus was. Both of these men had faith that Jesus would do what he said, and both of these men acted on faith for his will to be done. The leper was a social outcast, and the centurion was in a position of authority. The leper had no authority over his life, and the centurion had full authority over his life. But both men understood that Jesus was the authority, and ultimately his will was going to be done. Done. We claim we know him, yet we question him, and we forget the how and the why and how our relationship came to be. We are waiting for answers that will provide temporary satisfaction rather than eternal hope. We beg and plead for responses from God that will offer temporary satisfaction, hope, relief, rather than eternal joy. Are we living by faith or are we lacking it? God is sovereign in control over all things and he provides for our needs and will never meet our demands. You see, a great example of this is something we just read, but you may have missed. I've done it time and time again. You know how when you read the Bible, you just read it and you take whatever you can pick up off the page or you're lacking in time and so you just read it as fast as you can and ask God to reveal something to you. In studying this scripture, I've read it many, many times, but in studying this scripture, I found something. And if you knew about it, you're far smarter than me. But I found something. You see, if we look back at the very beginning when Jesus encounters this leper, And in verse three, it says, reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, be cleaned. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Verse four says, then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. That's what the instructions were given in Leviticus chapter 13. The priest's job was determined whether or not had leprosy. But then it says right afterwards, afterwards, it says, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You see, Jesus gave these instructions to Moses and Aaron in Leviticus 13, thousands of years before there was ever a case of leprosy. They were encountering different things. They gave it a name. They said, deal with skin diseases this way. These are the guidelines in order to keep our people safe and keep them clean. This leper was a subject to that law that the priest was adhering to. But in Leviticus chapter 14, the only thing you I encourage you to go back and read 13 and 14, but if you read just the subject heading on chapter 14, you will see that it says something along the lines of what to do when somebody is cleansed. Church, there was no one ever cleansed until Jesus' day. But the instructions were laid out thousands of years before when God encountered Moses and Aaron and gave them the directions. God's will is sovereign and in control. He knew that leprosy was going to be a problem. He understood that he needed to give the people the instructions on how to deal with it. And he understood that no one would experience freedom from it until his coming. But that did not stop him from giving them the instructions on how to deal with it. That is what he is referring to here. Go and make the sacrifice as it is instructed in Leviticus chapter 14 in the book that he gave Moses and authored, gave him the authorship of, asked him to write. So when this day came, when his will was ultimately done, they would know what to do and how to respond. Church, how are we going to respond?
knowing that we have the opportunity to be in a relationship with a sovereign God whose will is ultimate and authoritative and perfect. We can try to beg and plead with God. In fact, many of us, including myself, are probably going to continue to try to do so. But ultimately, his will is sovereign and in control. And I have to ask myself first, am I lacking in faith or am I living by it? Am I living by faith or am I lacking in it? And there's no in between. Are you living by faith or are you lacking in it? Are you living by faith or are you lacking in it? Church, we're called. It's necessary for us as beings made in his image to abide in Christ. What does that mean? That means to, to, to grow in a relationship with him, to grow in Christ's likeness, to pray, to study his word, to live in fellowship and community with fellow believers, to abide in Christ. But ultimately, in order to abide in Christ, we must first ask, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done. Lean into his sovereignty. He is the creator of the universe. He knows what tomorrow is going to hold. He doesn't give us the answers. He doesn't give us the blueprint, the instructions, because we can't handle it. We wouldn't even be able to fathom. Church, I invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Lord, I pray that today we would draw a line in the sand and ask ourselves, we look introspectively at our own hearts and ask, are we living by faith or are we lacking in it? Are we living by faith or are we lacking in it? Lord, there's some of us in this room are believers. We claim we know you. We claim we have an intimate relationship with you, but yet we beg and plead and make demands of you rather than asking, Lord, let your will be done. Lord, I pray that we would come before you on our knees, much like the leper, and ask that you would clean our hearts, give us pure motives. Lord, I pray that the same would be true for those who do not know you, that we would have the courage and boldness to approach you, to get on our knees and ask, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. You're the only one who can make me clean. Alleve me of the burden. And Lord, we know by the truth of your word and the promises that you have made that we have the opportunity to come in a relationship with you and to be made clean. All we have to do is ask. Lord, let your will be done in my life. I surrender my heart over to you. If that's you, I pray that in just a moment as this song plays and we have men and women in each of the corners of this room, that we'd have the boldness and courage to step out of our seats and let them know, I want to be made clean. I want to stop lacking faith and living for myself and living for my will and abide in Christ and live by faith and start every moment of every day by asking, Lord, let your will be done. It's your great name I pray.